Zakhar Khan and Sheikh for joining us. Um, I was editing a video, and the particular Sheikh was speaking about the importance of having a weird of the Quran, and I thought weird was like maybe like Arabic word for recitation. But then my friend came around. He's like, weird means commitment of the Quran. What is the concept of weird? The concept of weird is to have a continuous routine of whether it's adhkar, whether it's recitation of the Quran, uh, any righteous action that a person does on a continuous uh, basis is called a, a weird. And that's, yani, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam encouraged the Sahaba radiallahu anhum to have a weird in which they have a daily portion that they continuously recite from the Quran, whether it be five verses, 10 verses, 20 verses, a juz a day, regardless of the quantity, but at least that there is a daily connection with the Quran. And even to the extent where and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the hadith, he says that if a person for whatever reason misses out on their word on a certain day to make it up the next day. And the reason is so that the person can remain in connection with that word. Not just to say that, okay, I missed it today and that's fine. No, make it up. Even though it probably isn't obligatory to make it up, but that making it up means that that connection continues. And that's where the, the concept of word came from. What would the advice be if we were to commit a word of the Qur'an? So the Sahaba, they spoke the language of the Qur'an, but then there's us. So how do we balance the, mis like the, the lack of understanding of the Qur'an with the recitation of the Qur'an when we all should also understand its meanings? That's why in a situation like this, the person should maybe yani, focus more towards the understanding but at the same time, to keep the recitation aspect of the word alive as well. Which would mean that, for example, a person will recite directly from the Qur'an a lesser amount of verses. Instead of reciting, for example, one page or two pages or half a juzu or a juzu and so forth, they would recite a number of verses in which it would take them five or ten minutes maybe. And then after that, they can focus on the meaning of these verses. Uh, and when we say the meaning of these verses, we're not going to say to go into the tafsir of these verses because the tafsir of these verses would require as well some level of yani, understanding of the sciences of the Quran and the yani, sciences that are related to the Quran, but at least the translation, at least the meaning of the actual words that the person you just recited. So it could be one or two verses that the person starts off with a day, a certain time that you know, for example, that during this time of the day, most likely you were free, most likely you're not doing anything. So this time I'm going to recite one verse, two verses, and I'm going to look at the meaning of these verses and then stop there. And I'll do that for a week. I'll do that for a month. And then the individual will find themselves wanting to do more. Wanting to do more. Uh, unfortunately, we start the opposite way around. We start with a page, two pages, a juzu, and then as time passes, we find ourselves what? Wanting to do less and less and less and less until it sort of disappears and it's no longer there. So when you start off short, small, it will increase the way up. So when it comes to the Quran, there's so many gems and there's so much beautiful meanings. Even if we understood Arabic, we still can't access all the gems and the meanings. So it shows you how you know, limitless the Quran really is when it comes to that. And scholars are you know, spending their entire lifetimes trying to extract gems. And then many centuries later, still new gems are being discovered. And that's what the ulama, they say that the, the, yani the, the Qur'an itself is an endless ocean full of gems, jewels, pearls, yani things that uh, a person can yani continuously sort of stumble upon different yani, yani understandings and different meanings and, and so forth. And it just takes 
the biggest matter with the Quran is that a person needs to be patient in their sort of yani, pursuing of understanding the meaning. Unfortunately, we, we live, we're a generation that doesn't have patience. We're a generation that just wants everything instant, wants everything to be quick. We don't want to dedicate, we don't want to be patient in our dedication. And that's why when you read the biography of the pious predecessors, the scholars, and you see how much time they gave to seeking knowledge. And we're talking here, I mean, dedicating 10, 15, 20, 30 years of their life to this knowledge. And then a person comes today, wants to dedicate a lot less than that, and doesn't want to put in anywhere near the effort, but at the same time, they want to have the same result. It doesn't make sense. And that's why it, it's a process of time. It's a process of being patient. As the ulama says, Knowledge is a, it's a sea that its end is, is far. It doesn't have a, a place where you stop at. It just continues and continues and continues. And one thing that knowledge does or should do to a person as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَى اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Those who truly have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, truly conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are who? The ulama, the people of knowledge. So the greatest result that a person can take from knowledge is humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Humility towards the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the pathway. That's why the Quran, as the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says that the Quran is, is quicker, the meaning of the hadith, is quicker to be lost of the one who doesn't revise it than the camel when it's let loose. A camel when it's let loose, it just runs and it goes. The Quran is exactly the same. The moment you let go of it, it goes. And it's difficult to regain that connection. It's difficult to regain hold of the connection. And that's why the month of Ramadan is the month of the Quran. The month of Ramadan is the month, يعني, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he mentions in the hadith, and he says, كان النبي صلى الله كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أجود الناس. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was the most, أجود means the, the most generous in character. كان الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم أجود الناس. وكان أجود ما يقول في رمضان. And the most he would be generous is in Ramadan. He mentions why. He says because Jibreel would come down to the Prophet ﷺ every night and revise with him the Qur'an. And when he would do that, the result of it would be what? That the Nabi ﷺ, his character, as beautiful as it was and as, as perfect as it was in his manners, etiquettes, it would increase because of the Qur'an. Because he would be with Jibreel ﷺ, revising the Qur'an. As the hadith, Abdullah ibn Abbas says, يعني, أجود من الريح المرسلة. You know, the wind that comes by that just benefits everyone. It's not too strong and it's not too weak. It's not too strong that it becomes harmful and it's not too weak that it doesn't benefit. No, الريح المرسلة is the wind that comes and it's just perfect. After watching this video, I hope it sparks يعني, some attention and sparks some movement towards maybe dedicating time towards the Quran. And not the choice, but rather the obligation that I have towards the Qur'an itself. Because we don't want to fall under those whom and Nabi Sallallahu he says what? تَخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا They left this Qur'an. They, they sort of, and Al-Hajr here is the person leaving the recitation, leaving the rulings, leaving the guidance, leaving the application. And that's a very dangerous area. Imagine someone has taken something other than the Quran as their guidance. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us.